Good morning, it's April 22nd, and we invite you to join us, and we are so glad that you can join us as we worship the Lord together. We are doing a different service today in what I call on campus in our church. We are having a wonderful uh, Sunday uh, focused or based on missions, and so we are excited about that. We're looking forward. We have a guest speaker coming, and our missions committee has done a bunch of work and put this service together, so we're looking forward to that. So we will be doing that on campus. But online here, I'd like to do something a little different. We can't duplicate that this morning, but there's something that God has laid on my heart that I'd like to share with you this morning. And uh, I just want to do that in a moment. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this glorious day you've given us. We thank you for your grace and love. And now as we worship you together, I just pray that, uh, Father, we would lift up the name of Jesus. We would exalt him. We would praise him. We would truly love him as your children. So, Father, be with us now. Encourage hearts, Father, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender
Well, I'd like to focus on a subject that is very near to my heart, as you know, and uh, but this is dearest to my heart above all. It is our friendship, not only friends and friends we have and friendship, that subject, but this thing it stands way above general friendship. That's important. But nothing as important as our friendship with Jesus. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. We have a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, as the old hymn goes. We are so fortunate. I want to talk about that this morning. And I want to start with uh, just two verses of Scripture found in Luke 15. And it's verses 1 and 2. And I picked this because of the compassion. The fact that Jesus reaches out to these people that were social outcasts. I mean, they, they, were, they were disliked by the Jewish religious leaders. And then the uh, tax collectors especially were disliked by the general population. Uh, they had no use for them because they were con artists. They were ripping the people off. And they were being uh, terrible to them. Uh, and they were already taxed to the hilt. They were already suffering. It was a terrible, tough day to survive in. And then these people come along and uh, just have their hands in their pockets, taking their money, you might say. Not nice people. And they were right in the back pocket of the Romans, paying them off. And what they were doing uh, was was really um, not, not, not nice. It says here, now the tax collectors. So these were the people that were taking the money from the people and ripping them off. The tax collectors, so they were not well thought of by the people. They were heavily disliked. And sinners. But were these who were these people, these sinners? They were people that were not obeying the way that the Pharisees and Sadducees and uh, scribes were uh, interpreting the law, the, what they thought the law was in their legalistic sense. And so that's who these sinners were. We're all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law murdered, or muttered, I should say, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This man welcomes sinners. His arms were open and eats with them. When you ate with someone, it said social acceptance. Oh, come and eat with me. It was fellowship in that context, in that society of that day. Jesus was open. For God so loved the world. This is his love taking place in reality in that day. I'd like to read from also a paraphrase. I like the way this guy uses his wording. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful, he calls them doubtful reputation, were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And their grumbling triggered this story. And then we have the three parallels that follow that, or three parables, I should say, uh, that follow uh, this section of scripture. Well, there's Luke 15, and there are passages of Scripture like Mark 2, where the same terminology uh, is used, tax collectors and sinners. Um, they paint a picture of Jesus that, again, just strikes at my heart. It strikes at my heart, not only because I'm a sinner, because we all are sinners, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because of our condition. But I think it just has a special meaning too, as I have said, because of the empathy, the compassion that Jesus has on these people who nobody really give too much love towards in that society. They were social outcasts. 
And these are people that Jesus welcomed because he loved them and he cared about their salvation, their souls, and their well-being. And to me, that's super obviously attractive. He is the friend of sinners. He is the friend of sinners. You know, someone has wisely said, friendship is a cement that holds the world together. And certainly our friendship with Jesus that I can read about here. I can read about here in John 14. Listen, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus calls us friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. So in other words, Friendship comes, fellowship comes, walking in the Spirit comes by walking in His will. That's what He's saying. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my Father uh, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And that just means asking in the will of God. These people that he's talking about being his friends, our, our friendship with him means that we want what Jesus wants. And that's what we're asking for. In my name, we're asking Lord, do your will. This is my command. Love each other. That friendship, that friendship with Jesus cements our lives together like nothing else. So what in this type of friendship with Jesus, what can we accentuate this morning? What can we focus on to encourage us? I mean, there's there's so much. This is such a an unending broad topic. It's like someone has said uh, the friendship and, and love of Jesus is like the ocean. We can see the start of it, but we can't see the end of it. It just keeps going on and on and on. And that's so very true. That's so very true. The first thing that I think we need to reflect on the foundation of it all is a friend who loves us, this love that's at the heart or the core of friendship with Jesus. Again, as we have read, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You know, that, that love that we talk about, you know, there's we've, we've mentioned lately in, uh, in my preaching and in different sermons we've talked about, there's there's uh, probably about generally seven uh, words in the Greek for for love, where they're all translated in, in English in one word, love. But there's that unique word, that agape love, that special love that is associated with Jesus. They took this this rather ambiguous term to do with friendship, and they just infused into it our friendship with Jesus the special nature of the sacrificial, unconditional love of the Lord Jesus Christ for us, exemplified in the giving of his life, his passion and his death on our behalf. My old teacher at Acadia, now with the Lord, Dr. McRae, who I love deeply, called it the Christ event, his birth, his, his life, his teaching, his healing, his love, his passion, his death, his resurrection, his reign, etc. All go into what uh, encompasses his love in all these areas. A love that's just overflowing. And we say thank you this morning. That special love for us that agape love, and it is the foundation of our friendship with Jesus. And that love lifts us. As the old chorus go, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. 
Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Maybe everything is going fantastic this morning. I hope it is. That's wonderful. Maybe, though, you're struggling with some things. Maybe you've had a rough week or there's different health issues you're struggling with. I just want to tell you this morning that Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. And he has provided so many things through his general grace, like the wonderful health care system, the, 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 the advances in health care we have. Just think of many parts of the world and what they don't have and what we do have. It's right at our fingertips that we can use. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Social system that's very different that can help us and uh, different uh, support networks that can help us. Different things given to us by his sovereign grace. And our friends, our friends, the friendship with Jesus and our human friends that can come alongside us and help us and empower us, our family, different things like that that are so precious. He's given us so much. That special love that he has for us. I heard someone talking this week about um, the old days of wallets when we used to carry pictures around in our wallets of our kids and our family and all that because they were precious to us. Now that doesn't happen. We have our cell phones and we have pictures. I'm not a great picture taker, but we have pictures on our cell phones of our family and friends and different events and our pets and <laughs> everything else. But I'll tell you, that's how we need to think. Jesus has us in his wallet. It's kind of a, a maybe a different type of illustration, but that's how much he loves us. He's got a picture of you. He's got a picture of me in his wallet, that type of imagery, because of what he thinks about us, how precious we are, how he loves us so much and keeps us close to his heart. He is a friend who loves us unconditionally. And his love will never, as C.S. Lewis says, our love may come and go and, and our human love, that type of thing, uh, sadly enough, in some situations changes. But Jesus' love for us never will. It is unconditional and it is steadfast. So a friend... Jesus is a friend who loves us, and he is a friend who will never leave us. Never, never, never. He will never leave us or forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5b. John 10, 28 and 30. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Do you hear those words, my friend? No one can snatch us out of his hand. We are secure. Romans eight thirty-five and 39, listen, he, he presents the whole gamut here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is a friend who will never let us go, who will never leave us. Never, never leave us. And he is a friend who understands and encourages us. How important that is, with our human friends, but even how much more important it is with Jesus 
because he knows us better than we even know ourselves. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, and old J.B. Phillips, our beloved Anglican friend, he says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has entered the inmost heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our faith, for we have no superhuman high priest to whom our weaknesses are unintelligible. He himself is shared fully in all our experience of temptation, except that he never sinned. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with the fullest confidence, the fullest confidence that we may receive mercy, that we may receive mercy for our failures and grace to help in the hour of need. He is there because he has been where we are in our lives today, both in the good times and the not so good times, and he fully understands. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us inside out. And he's there with that unconditional, steadfast love to minister to us, to encourage us, and to never let us go. There is a phrase of a poem that says, A true friend is he who listens to your deepest sorrows. A true friend is like toothpaste. When it is put under pressure, it appears. Sadly, in human relationships, sometimes we have friends that are like that. That when they're put, when things are put under pressure, when we're put under pressure, like the toothpaste, they don't. Instead of coming out and appearing, they don't appear. You can't find them. That's not like Jesus. He's the farthest thing from that. He is always going to be there for us. And please remember that he loves you. He loves you. And he is a friend who forgives and empowers. He forgives and empowers. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's Jesus. He is there and he is the friend of sinners and he is there to forgive us. And that, that isn't a game to um, drag us down. The, the devil wants to discourage us. The, the devil wants us to to uh, focus on the negative. That's not Jesus. He wants to set us free. He wants to say, hey, my child, I love you. You're forgiven. We all blow it. We all drop the ball. We all miss the mark. We all get off track sometimes. We are human. We have a fallen nature. We have an old nature. And that's us. That's us. But we walk in fellowship with Jesus because he is our friend. And he is a friend of sinners. And he is there, as John says, to forgive us, to empower us, to help us to go on and to rise above. He wants the very best for you and me. And as a loving, as a loving parent would want the very best, so Jesus wants the very best for us. And that's where he's at. And that's where he's at. One of the Proverbs that we looked at a bit when we were doing the book of Proverbs says in Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Howard Hendricks says he defines a close friend as someone who knows everything about you, yet totally accepts you, will listen to your most uh, heretical ideas without rejecting you, and knows how to criticize you in a way you'll listen to. In the empowerment, he comes alongside us in his word and directs us and helps us and encourages us, just like a good friend would. A good friend wants the best for us and comes alongside us lovingly, compassionately, in empathy, in listening and understanding. Jesus listens to us, and then he guides us on. He helps us rise above. He helps us rise above. 
He is a friend who cares, who just doesn't turn, uh, 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 use the phrase, a blind eye or a, a deaf ear towards something. No, he's there. He takes things in and he helps us, obviously, through the power of his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through so many different dynamics, graces we have in the Christian life to change us and empower us and mold us into his very image, helps us be Christ-like. And that is so vitally important. He is a friend who not only forgives, as good human friends do, because we hurt each other from time to time, who forgives, and like good human friends, he empowers us. He helps us change to become better. He helps us change to become better like him, like Jesus. That's our goal. And Jesus is a friend who shows us how to be a friend. When you want to understand how to be a good friend, simply do this. Look at Jesus. The Peanuts cartoon showed Peppermint Patty talking to Charlie Brown, in which she said, guess what, Chuck? The first day of school I got to sent to the principal's office. It was your fault, Chuck. Looks at her. Charlie Brown responds, my fault. How could it be my fault? What do you say? Why do you say everything is my fault? To which she declares, well, you're my friend, aren't you, Chuck? Then you should have been a better influence on me. <laughs> Jesus shows us how to be better friends to one another. There are many things that go into friendship, and uh, we can't discuss them all this morning, obviously. But friends need to be there for one another. Friends need to listen to one another. Friends need to uh, love unconditionally. Friends need to walk empathetically with people walking in their shoes. All those type of dynamics that we see in the life of Jesus, we see are the type of dynamics that we need to build into friendship, especially what we would call Christian friendship, as being friends of those around us as followers of Jesus Christ. Because we need to reflect his life, his love and grace towards others. He shows us how to be a friend. Again, if you want to be a good friend, start by looking at Jesus. And he is a friend who is there to prepare the best for us. A woman was trying hard to get the ketchup out of the ketchup bottle. During her struggle, the phone rang you ever had that happen? So she asked her four-year-old daughter to go and pick up the phone and answer. And the little girl said, Mommy can't come to the phone to talk right now. She's hitting the bottle. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. Get some messages a bit mixed up and out of context. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Our love for Jesus means that we, again, are seeking his will. And this is found in a difficult passage of Scripture where it's talking about uh, the overall effects of, of sin on creation and, and how creation yearns for the, its redemption and all these things. So uh, this isn't like the health and wealth and prosperity people portrayed on TV. This is completely... I misquoted so many times. Romans 8.28 is in the context of our uh, spiritual good, our eternal good. Yes, God wants the best for us in, in every way, in our temporal needs and our, our health needs and all those things. And we, we should focus on those, get the best health care we can get, uh, get the best things to come alongside us and help us, all those things. And God's involved in that, and he wants that very much. But 
For instance, that doesn't mean I have a problem uh, walking as well as I'd like to walk. I would like to be able to walk better, but right now I, I can't. We're working on that problem. I'm seeking proper medical uh, team to help me and, and things are coming along. But you know, you see what I'm seeing here. It, it's not a guarantee of health and wealth for, for us. It is a guarantee of spiritual well-being of spiritual well-being when we look forward to one day when we will be with Jesus when it is our time to go home to be with him to be with the Lord that's what this verse is talking about and he says over in the context again it is looking at eternity this verse really in its ultimate fulfillment that's what it's looking at and it also wants us to know that Jesus is there helping us along the way now in our temporal needs. As we journey through life, he's there, he loves us, he cares about us, and he wants the very best for us in areas like health care and all these different dynamics. Because I know many of you that listen are struggling with health issues. Please be assured that Jesus loves you. He 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 is there to help and and to empower our healthcare professionals to help you. Also, we look at John 14, 1 to 3. And this is probably the earliest passage on the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church. And it says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus has us in his hand. He has us in control. And he has gone to prepare that unique place for us that one day he can come back for his bride, the church, and take us to be with him. And Paul says, so we will ever be with the Lord. It is a promise from him. It is a promise from him. And for all Christians who have put their faith and trust, obviously their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he's coming. One day he's coming and he will take us back to be with him. To be with him. Oh, Jesus, what a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. You know, our feelings again may come and go, as C.S. Lewis reminds us, but God's love for us does not. His love for us will never change. And please remember this week, that God loves you, that Jesus loves you, that you are loved by the Holy Spirit, the triune God. And the triune God is there to minister to you in love as your friend and to empower you in the various ministries that encompass Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we think specifically of that concept, we think probably more specifically of Jesus and his friendship with us as he represents the Father, as the incarnation brought him to earth so that he might travel with us, that he might encourage us, that he might show us what God's love is all about. And certainly we see that as we read today in the pages of Scripture as the Holy Spirit takes that love, that sheds that love abroad in our hearts, that sheds that love abroad in our hearts. And as our Heavenly Father reached out in his sovereign plans of love, the whole plan of redemption unfolds. All these dynamics reach out in the whole ministry of the triune Godhead in love for us, for you and me. And we just say thank you. So I hope these words have encouraged you this morning as we have thought about our friendship with Jesus and the great love that he has for us. And remember, he is the friend of sinners. 
He is that compassionate and holy one that will never, never leave us or let us go. To that we say, Amen. I need now under your wing cover me within your mighty hand when be your sins Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit this morning and just say thank you for your unending love, that infinite love, that unconditional love, that love that lifts us up. And we just say thank you. So, Father, just be with us as we close this morning. Encourage hearts. And may this message just lift people up. May it encourage us this week as we seek to live for Jesus, as we seek to be more Christ-like, as we seek to uh, encourage people and hold out that special love that he has for us. We give that love towards others. Give it away as a gift, as Jesus has given it unconditionally as a gift to us. So, Father, be with us now as we close. Just bless us, Father, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.